Hi. We're live and we're fetching and we have thoughts on defensive tackles. This class that is <laughs> perceived to be really bad. I found some silver linings, I have to say. I watched over 30 defensive tackles this week. It was hard. Some of them were not very good. Some of them really disappointed me, but others sort of jumped to the forefront. All kinds of texts. We've got all kinds of things to talk about. Scott Karasik with me on the line. Scott, what other good things happened to you this week? Because for me, I got promoted at my day job. I had a great I have a three day weekend. I have a great week. So I don't know what you're doing. Um I sold a couple cars, I went to a training class. You know, same old, same old, but status quo is always better than nothing. You know, I'd rather have a week where I sold a couple cars and a week where I didn't. So, that was good. I suppose so. I mean, tonight we're going to start off talking, I guess, about defensive tackles. We promise we talk about them after last week. And at some point tonight we'll decide which position is next on our list. And then we'll probably talk about something random. If anyone wants to join, feel free to tweet at me and Scott, and we could try to get you hooked up via Google and G Hangout or whatnot. Um, but for now, I guess we can start on the defensive tackle class. I have a great comparison to drop for a certain defensive tackle. Um, I guess we're going to start with, I think we're going to have the same answer, but I'm not 100% sure. Regardless of technique, regardless of any sort of factor, who is your number one interior lineman in this class? Ooh. I think we're the same person, but I want to see what you say. Because I have a comparison to drop that I've been dying to drop all week. I've got Leonard Williams. Like, that, like unless one of these guys from... Unless there's like a, a, a defensive tackle who's just two years out and a redshirt sophomore that I'm missing. Because I, mi I miss a lot of redshirt sophomores. I always do. That are potentially able to. Leonard Williams, man, by far. He, he reminds me so much of Gerald McCoy that I just don't know. I don't know why you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to have him on your team. I would love, love, love to have a Gerald McCoy type in Atlanta. I feel like Rasheed Hageman's really good, don't get me wrong, but if they could somehow get Leonard Williams, if they cut and like move to a pure 4-3 and they got Leonard Williams and Hageman was the one tech and Leonard was the three tech, I would absolutely love that lineup. I feel like that's more dangerous. That's as dangerous as Sue in the uh, Sue and uh, Fairley up in Detroit. So I just dropped on Twitter my Leonard Williams comparison I've been hiding all week long. And the more I watched him, you know, there was a defensive end in the 3-4 for the Pittsburgh Steelers named Aaron Smith. He went to Northern Colorado University, and he ended up being a beast pro. And that is who I see when I see Leonard Williams. He's somebody who has the penetrative ability to get into the backfield, who can anchor the point of attack, who can play any defensive line position if really he's called upon to do it. You need to think about Leonard Williams. He was injured all year this year. He really didn't have a great year because he was hurt. He was banged up. Two years ago, he showed amazing explosiveness. I think he can bring it back to the forefront if he's in the pros. I'm a big fan of his, and I think also considering that, I don't know your opinion about the rest of the defensive tackle class or the interior line class as it is. I don't think that there's a lot of first-round talent in this class. I think there are some solid contributors, but I'm not sure there are guys who I would say are first-round players in terms of their explosiveness, in terms of their scheme versatility. Uh, I think Leonard Williams sort of is a scheme-diverse, totally agnostic player who really is one of the best players in this class. I think he's going to do great things in the NFL. Totally agnostic? He's the Dr. Pepper of defensive tackles. Definitely. Um. <laughs> I, I'll agree with you there. He's a uh, he's a guy who could play any technique, one to five. Probably be really explosive in all of them. Um, I don't like the idea of two gapping a guy with his explosiveness, but he could do either or. I mean, he's gonna have when all said and done for me. 
unless he just like falls off these last two games that I watch him, he's going to have a probable top ten grade. Like he's right there. He's guaranteed top fifteen. Like, but unless I see something horrible from him in the bowl game or I hear something negative about him off off the field, he's gonna be given a top ten grade. Just on pure talent. Uh, I agree. Top ten for me too. He has a top ten grade written down for me right now. Um, so who is your second best defensive tackle? I think here we may deviate because I have someone who's a bit of an outsider. That's where it goes a little bit different. Um, I do like a couple of the guys that are. I do like Eddie Goldman. I do like Shelton. Uh, I do like. Uh, what's that guy's name from uh, Fresno? Uh, Davidson. Um, but the guy who I think really kind of takes the cake is Michael Bennett. I think if he if there's another guy out there, and again this isn't a high first round guy. This is a like like a late one, early two kind of grade on Michael Bennett. But he reminds me a lot of like a Kevin Williams type. So, I, yeah, I, I, like I can see that. I like him a minute. Um, I don't have quite as high a grade on him because I think he's a little bit one-dimensional in terms of how he wins. I think he wins off the snap with bursts, and I think that that's a little bit – I'm not sure how projectable it is to the next level. I think it helps to a degree, but I have a third-round grade on Michael Bennett. My second defensive tackle, and Eddie Goldman, by the way, is somebody who I think could sneak in to tie this guy – I like Goldman the more I watched him, to be honest. I didn't love him in the preseason, but the more I watched him, he's better than Mario Edwards. I'm not a... Definitely that's where dichotomy began to shift in one direction for me. But my number two defensive tackle, and I've been touting him all week on Twitter, is Terry Williams from East Carolina. And I am getting more and more convinced that he's the Aaron Lynch of this class in terms of somebody who has some off-the-field questions. When you look on the field, the guy is a dynamic. He's a force of nature. I mean, he's 6'1", 353. He can one-gap. He can two-gap. He can penetrate. He can hold his own with the point. He does everything he needs a defensive tackle to do. Absolutely everything. His last name is Williams, too, and there have been a lot of great Williams defensive tackles. And that is a factor that, you know, you don't really consider. But, you know, Jamal Williams, Pat Williams, Kevin Williams, all Williamses. So, I don't know. It's just like a fun fact. But either way, Terry Williams is somebody who I think can play any technique. I think he can do whatever he needs to do. See, originally my comparison for him was then Terry Poe, but I think a better comparison for him might be Terrence Knighton on the Broncos because he's somebody who wins with penetration but has the build and the technique to be converted into more of a defensive tackle, two-gapping, responsible role. And I think that's where Terry Williams wins. I have a late first, early second on him right now. He's the only other defensive tackle I have sniffing in the first round. And I think he's a really nice sleeper. I like him a lot. I'm going to be honest with you. I have not watched him play one minute because I have not gotten into the American at all this year. Like, I'm not anywhere close to the American, so I'm going to add him to my watch list right now because... I do not blame you. I will say that people who've watched him either, I think, sort of cast him aside because they might miss the bigger picture or they just go off reputation. Everything I've seen, I think he's better than Goldman. I mean, the thing about, like, Goldman and Malcolm Brown and Preston Smith, who are my other top three defense... They're my other top five defensive tackles. They're three, four, five, respectively... They're all really good players who went to great schools. They do everything right, but they're not dynamic. They're decent players who can get you a sack or two, but they're not going to change the game for your defense. And that is what I need out of a first-round pick. I need someone who can change the game for my defense. I think Terry Williams can do that. I don't think other guys can. I mean, it's just sort of my personal philosophy, but I'm really intrigued to see where Williams goes. I don't think he'll go in the first round, but... I'm, my evaluation, I'm going to have him up there. I might even have him top 20 when it's all said and done, although this class has been really deep. I've only looked through one position so far, so there's still a lot of time left there. Now, 
who's one player who, when you looked back at him, you thought he was pretty overrated? You uh, you said him just a minute ago, and that's Eddie Goldman. Um, people are saying that he's this top twenty prospect, this top fifteen prospect, and I think he needs another year down at Florida State. I really do. I don't like him as a. Uh, I really, really, really don't like him in a fir- in the first round. Um, a guy who I'm kind of lumping in with the defensive tackles right now is Mario Edwards Jr. Because I don't like him as an end at all. But I think if he comes out as a three technique, he could be a first round pick and make it make a GM look like a genius as a first round pick. Because he can play again any technique, one for six, be explosive, but he ha- he doesn't have a lot of experience doing the interior techniques. So I'd like to see him try those, but it's not it's a lot easier to rush straight forward than it is to rush, you know, from the side than it is to rush from the side. It's easier to rush straight through the one gap, straight through the A gap, straight through the B gap than it is to rush outside, bend the arc. I, I'm not a huge fan of Mario Edwards as a defensive end. I'd rather see him as a tackle. But I think that that entire Florida State line is really overrated. Hi, oh. Justin. Hey, what's up, guys? How are we doing tonight? We got Justice here to talk to us about defensive tackles. If he, if, if they're math enough for him, if they're math enough um, for me. I will say one defensive tackle I, I think is overrated. I want to hear Justice's opinion on him. What do you think of Carl Davis from Iowa? Because I'm really not impressed. I am not really actually a big fan of Carl Davis. Um, when I was watching his stuff, I know people were like, "Oh, you know, s- scouts are gonna overlook his like effort and just like overall technique and stuff." based on his combine numbers and things like that. When I watch him, I don't really see an explosive guy. Um, number 90, I forget his name. He's got a hyphen in his last name. Um, he's actually, like, one of my guys. Like, I'm really excited about him. Yeah, he's just, like, all effort all the time. Like, he's really undersized and at a small frame, like, the way he's built already. I wonder how much he's going to be able to put on at the next level and be stout in the run game. But, I mean, this is a dude who's just, like, a high-effort guy just overall. Like, he's flying. He's chasing down running backs from behind all over this Carl Davis tape and stuff. Like I, I, I think I'd probably take him over Carl Davis at this point. Like I'm not, I'm not gonna be a Carl Davis guy. All right, I gotta say because I was in the same boat and then I rewatched all the Trinka Passat that I could get my hands on. And he's not very good. Um, he's just not very good off the ball. He's not very explosive. His movements okay. I actually ended up downgrading him, but I fell into a similar situation because I know one guy who a lot of guys are high on is Darius Kilgo out of Maryland. And he's somebody who people say can be sort of like that two-gapping defensive tackle that um, can be scheme-flexible and has a little bit of penetrative ability. The more I watched him, the guy who caught my eye is Keith Bowers, the guy next to him, the defensive tackle, who I thought had some great bursts and some great acceleration. I think he looked great off the ball. He is a big guy. Uh, I think that he might be better than Kilgo. So I sort of like went in the same boat, like looking at all these defensive tackles this week. And I thought Trinka Passat was the shit, but he ended up being a little bit underwhelming to me where I watched. Um, I, I haven't seen the other guy. Really, what I've seen of Kilgo is seeing like other people go against Kilgo and just seeing Kilgo flash at points. Um, so like I I don't have a grade on Kilgo at this point. Um I, I've really been focusing more on like offensive linemen and like edge rushers uh right now and quarterbacks. Um but yeah, I mean Kil- Kilgo looks like a guy who clearly should be drafted. And I believe he's at the East West Shrine game. Um, I think I actually just wrote a piece on – it wasn't yeah. actually writing. It was just like a list for Football Savages about uh, 32 guys that I think like – then like the next 32 guys who are like the best seniors who probably should like get senior bowl invites or move-ups or whatever. Um, and Kilgo was one of those dudes because I, I, I saw Kilgo flash. And I, I mean I just liked his game. I need to peep that other guy. No, I like Kilgo too, and I think as a third day guy, he's good. Right. I heard some second day hype, and I was like, nah. No, now, a comparison else. for Leonard Williams, I think you'll like this. I, I tweeted it out. I don't know if you saw it. No, so it was, I saw you tweet out that you have a good comparison for him, but I didn't see the subsequent yeah. tweet. Yeah, so my comparison is, is a little bit old school. Aaron Smith, the old 3 4 defensive end for the Steelers, is my comparison for Leonard Williams, because I think he's scheme diverse. I think it sort of like takes his explosiveness and puts it in like the right sort of mindset. So what do you see when you see Leonard Williams? Um, as far as like 
the the one thing that messes me up the most with Leonard Williams is that he's just like bad off the snap. Like it's really weird that the two consensus best like defensive linemen, I guess if you want to call Gregory that, um, are like they they spend a lot of time in the backfield, but they're pretty bad off the snap. Um, I think Ben Detan put it best when he was like last off the snap, first in the backfield. Um, that's probably the best way to describe Leonard Williams and uh, uh, Randy Gregory. You know, Le- Leonard Williams is just like strong, man. Like he's just all sorts of strong. Like he he just demolishes these Pac-12 offensive line, uh, offensive uh, linemen. But y- you worry about being late. You know, like if you're gonna be late yeah. in the NFL, that's that. Like I could totally see like he's gonna be a case study for this, right? He's gonna be a case study f- to see how yeah. much like burst off the line of scrimmage means. Well, the thing with Leonard Williams, though, that I said is, you know, I'm, I'm a, I totally love burst off the line. That's why I really like Gabe Wright this year as a sleeper in my defensive tackle class. I really like Ray Drew. We've talked about him before. Right. The thing with Leonard Williams is that he looked a lot better two years ago with his burst. I think yeah, before his injury? injury sort of played an effect there in terms of limiting his burst. Maybe. So that's my only question with him. I think that he's sort of uh, – I think he sort of got limited by his injuries. That's my thought on him. I still have. Yeah, I mean, how how high are you willing to go on him? Like, it's really hard to I tell in this class. Like, it seems like the consensus top four guys, at least as far as like being mocked, are going to be Mariota, Winston, Leonard Williams, Randy Gregory. And as far as those yeah. four go, I mean, you see definitive flaws in all four of their games. I'm not sure yeah, if there's I, like a slam dunk player in this draft. My thing is, I wouldn't. I would. My son that plays Mariota. I think they take Mariota number one for sure. I think he's number one guy in this class. So I'm with you, Team with, Oregon. I'm with you there. Yeah. Um. I. The thing that scares my Gregory is that he's lazy at times. He has some effort issues that scare the crap out of me. Uh, every time I watch him play, he coasts through at least two quarters per game. Really, really scary right. to me. Um. I don't know if you've seen that as well, but I don't even have. I think Fowler's better. I think I would take Fowler. Think Gregory? Yeah. Um, because Fowler see, is not a the point. Yeah, he is. I worry about – see, I'm not going to be a big Fowler Ray guy. I already know this at this point. I think I graded him both You don't think both we'll be as, No, I, I have him as high second-round picks, um, which isn't bad. I just don't – like, what worries me about Fowler is I, I kind of worry about his burst too. And for an edge rusher, I think that matters a lot. Like, I, I, I put a lot into – how much like burst and speed to power conversion and things like that. Um, I mean, Fowler's Fowler's a really good college player. Um, I just don't know what his upside is going to be at the next level. And I think if you're drafting in the first round, as much as we like to say, uh, you know, don't draft like those bus guys, right? Like I, I just got off the phone with some uh, an NFL scout probably two three hours ago, and he was talking to me about how you know the the, the NFL thinks of bus rate in the first round as Pro Bowlers. It's like there's a 65% bus rate in the NFL, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" It was like, "Oh, well, guys who don't make it don't make it to the Pro Bowl. In general, they like hit guys who are gonna be good. Um, but if I'm gonna take a swing at a guy in the first round, as far as like edge rushers are concerned, I'm going for upside. Um, and sometimes I'll take in that Vernon Golston, and sometimes I'll take in that Jamal Anderson. But sometimes I'm taking, you know, I'm taking in Clay Matthews. But I mean, the thing with Dante Fowler to me is, whenever I watch him on tape, I think his Burst is fine. I mean, I think that when we get to the combine... It's we'll just not great. It's just not great. Has, I guess that's my thing. But it's better than, like, Dupree, who some people are seeing as a first-round guy. It's See, better I like than, Dupree like, more. I like Dupree a little bit more. I like Dupree, too, but I think that Fowler has a better combination of sort of burst off the snap and also strength the line of scrimmage. I mean, the thing with, like, Vic Beasley and Shane Ray, like, they have great bursts, but they don't really have that much else. Beasley's actually better against the run than Ray is, in my opinion. Yeah, the thing about Ray is Ray runs so high-cut... Um, it really think makes me worry about his like change of direction than... skills at the next level and things like that. He's a like second round guy, as some people have said. Yeah, I, I think he's a second round guy. I really like. I know McShay dra- uh, mocked him in like the top ten. I think Kuiper did too. Some people were talking about Ray going number one. I absolutely don't see that. But that's not really my type. Like I understand that's not my type of guy. That's not like uh. So so my top guys right now, um, as far as guys who I give first round grades to. Um, as far as edge rushers is concerned, I have Gregory, I have Beasley, I have Oakman, I have Eli Harold, and I have Bud Dupree. And then I have kind of that that next tier of guys being uh, Dante Fowler Jr., uh, Shane Ray, Omagbeo Digazoa. But you really worry about you know his hip issues. I mean, he's had two two hip surgeries before he really got playing time at UCLA. 
Um, and then the next guy is Holy Kikaha. And as uh, as uh, Scott said before, you know, Holy Kikaha is kind of like um, he's kind of Jarvis Jones, right? Like he's not gonna be he, he's not really like a super athlete by any means. He's just kind of a tech guy. Um, you know, his uh, his judo background definitely shows up on uh, tape. But yeah, that, that that's just kind of where I stand on this edge class so far. The the guy who I really don't understand. Um, you know, people are talking about how the gap between Marcus Golden and uh, Shane Ray isn't that big. And I know, I, I believe uh, Dan Kadar from Mocking the Draft actually ranked him as, like, he's, like, 27th overall player or something. And Dan does a great job at stuff. Um, I, I'm just, I just really don't see it with Marcus Golden. Like, I, I can't imagine Marcus Golden not going in, like, the fifth round. I can see a team taking him higher because he's got a couple of traits that a team will really love. A team like Pittsburgh would love to have a guy like him. But they also took Worlds in the fourth. They also took Jarvis Jones in the fifth. I mean, some teams just don't understand modern NFL technique or modern NFL scheme, so you've got to look at it that way. Some guys are going to go higher than we have them. Right, just right. Because, like I said, the Kansas when they took Tari Poe, I said the Kansas City Chiefs don't know what the hell they're doing. So that's why they're going to take Dontari Poe. And it actually worked out for them. I'm actually very glad that it worked out for them. But I saw it a mile away. It didn't make sense for the scheme they were running under Cornell, that two-gap scheme. So I said, yep, they don't know what they're doing. They're going to take Dontari Poe here, and it's going to be a bad fit. Now under Bob Sutton, they're running a one-gap 3-4, and you see the entire scheme work. So... Right, that okay. makes sense. I mean, you you definitely see which like j just just by doing this math rushes thing, and I've gone through now what a decade of front seven players where I've ran the regressions and things. You definitely see which teams look at athletes and which teams don't. Um, Pittsburgh is almost like the one you like hold up, and you're like they don't care about combine numbers worth anything. Like they do not care <laughs> if you like have any sort of athleticism at all. All they're doing is running tech. Like that. That's really like it, it, Pittsburgh. Pretty much drafts off like tech. Um, they'll they'll draft undersized pass rushers, and then they'll also they also just generally not even just like front seven players. They almost exclusively only draft like power five guys. You know, it's funny because I was listening back to some of our fetching draft Nick shows from like two years ago, mm -hmm. and we had a mock draft. It was me, Scott, Alex, and Mike Ben, who now works for the Vikings. And we were doing a mock draft where we talked about the Steelers, and we all mocked them Jarvis Jones. And I remember saying on that show, and I listened back to it, you know, I wouldn't be shocked if they took Jamie Collins at 17, because Jamie Collins would make a lot of sense as an edge rusher in their scheme. So it's kind of, it's the perfect dichotomy, because, like, you got the athlete in Jamie Collins, and you got the sort of, like, polished guy in Jarvis Jones, and you see who they took, and you see who another team took, and you see which one right now is better. Right. Um, but math either rushers, way, just the math rushers, take the athletes. Yeah, play middle linebacker, let them sugar the A-gaps every time, and it's magic. Like, as, as far as the A-gaps is magic, as I know you saw in your game that you played against him. But question, either is way... Math, is math rushers just Jay Waldron's formula, Waldo? <laughs> Oh, no, 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 no. It, it, it's adjusted from there. But I, absolutely, I mean, he did a bunch of the legwork that, like... Uh, I, I wouldn't say it's based off of what he's done, but I'll say that, like, he opened my eyes to things and, like, how to look at some of these statistics um, that come out – or some of these, I guess you'd say, just numbers in general that come out of the combine and how, like, you should weight them and that density absolutely matters. Dems density matters so much yeah. um, when putting these numbers into, like, relativity. Because um, you'll have a dude who runs super fast, but if he's 215 pounds, I mean, that, you're putting him on a different scale than a dude who's, you know, J.J. Watt size. I'm surprised, though, that you're like Fowler, because Fowler's pretty dense as a pass rusher, and I think he's going to test well. So he's someone who I know I, right now, I need to rewatch all my edge guys. I just rewatched all my defensive tackles. I actually so like you also. I have a late first round pick on him. I don't have a, I don't have an early second. I have a late first on, on Fowler? him. Fowler? Yes. Yeah, no, I, I, he's my number one right now, because I really like what he On your board? Team. Just over, like, like edge rushers he, or like I, everyone, everyone? I mean, edge rushers, Yes. I think he's better than every senior I've watched so far in this class. But that, that's also seniors. Interesting. See, I'm, I'm, so, I'm a Beasley guy, though. See, I, I like flashy things. I, I like, like shiny Beasley. things. I think Beasley's <laughs> better against the run than Ray, but I'm still scared about him the next level. I yeah, like B, B, I actually broke down, uh, I, I broke down Beasley with uh, Matt Waldman 
um, for his like RSP uh, film session thing, and we just we watched his game against Florida State. And I know uh, Scott brought up that like I mean Beasley lost the game at the end of it. I mean he completely like bit yeah. on uh, on you know he he bit inside when he should have had outside containment. But in general, I mean he did okay, especially for his size. I mean he knows how to use leverage. Um, he has very quick hands. He's gonna get hands on these guys before you know they're gonna get a shot at him. Um, so I, I mean I I'm still a Beasley guy. I mean Scott if Atlanta like took it. Vic Beasley in the first round. How would you feel? Because last year I felt like if I were in Atlanta's position and the draft went down exactly how it went and Jake Matthews and Vic Beasley were on the board, I would have gone Beasley. I would love to have Vic Beasley in Atlanta, especially if they start Jonathan Massaqua on the other side and bring in a free agent and basically have Beasley, Massaqua, and the free agent just rotate mm-hmm. until Beasley gets up to speed. But that also depends on who the hell the defensive coordinator is. Right. If Atlanta's right. running a pure 3-4, I'd yeah. much rather see Randy Gregory because I see Simeon Rice and Randy Gregory. If Atlanta's going to run a pure... Um, sorry, if Atlanta's running a pure 4-3, I'd rather see Randy Gregory. If they're going to run a pure 3-4, right. I would love Nick Beasley because I see a lot of Robert Mathis with a little bit more speed and a little bit more size coming out. In, uh, so do you, in, do you think... Like, I would be like... Mean, like Oh, go ahead, go ahead, Ethan. My, no, my comp for Beasley is Robert Mathis, like two a I my See, I have I have Bruce Irvin, but I'm a Bruce That's Irvin. That's my guy. comp for Ray. I think my comp for Shane really? Ray. Is, yeah, I think really? Ray. I don't. I don't think Ray has the closing speed. So I See, believe it was either against Bruce Akron or Central Florida, where there was a botched uh punt uh snap. Right. So a botched long snap on a punt, and he wasn't able to close in that speed. And if that's your first round edge rusher, and he's not able to, you know, close the speed on a botch snap on a punt, you know, against lower level of competition, I mean, what are we really doing here? That that was one of my things. I know Alex yeah. Brown, who does optimum scouting stuff for uh, the Big Ten, or he he covers the Big Twelve, Big 12 and he right? covers yeah. the SEC. Um, he does a very good job with these guys, and he was doing. Uh, he did a little breakdown with Matt Wallman again for that film room session. Um, and he was saying, yeah, I see him as, like, an early second-round pick. And, like, the, the way he was talking about it was almost, like, an assured thing. Like, no, like, this guy can't be a first-rounder, not the way he's playing. But someone's going to, like, take him in the second round because he's a pass rusher. I mean, people didn't think that Preserving could be a first-rounder, but then the Seahawks took a chance on him. And to be yeah, fair... Yeah, but he's a freak athlete, though. I don't, I don't think Ray is going to be a freak I athlete. Think I think Ray's pretty freaky. I, I, mean, think I think Ray, Ray has burst. Learn. I think Ray has burst. I think that's... I think that's different than overall athleticism. I think you'd say Vic Beasley has overall athleticism. I think you, you see his hip flexibility. I think you see his ability to run the arc. Um, I'm not sure Ray really runs the arc. You know, he, he's not that kind of guy. That's why Ray's kind of in that odd spot where he's an undersized pass rusher. But on nickel and dime downs, I'd almost like him closer to the ball. You know, clo- closer. You know, as almost a defensive tackle, just because of his quickness, he's going to be able to beat those guards off the line of scrimmage. Um, and almost kind of have like a Mike Daniels type of impact. A closer to the ball, I hope you mean like a six or or even a five technique, not like a defensive tackle. Because I'm thinking like maybe three. Like I think maybe three. I think he maybe slide into three. I don't know about that. I, cause See, that, I, I, that's that's where I'm conflicted because that's that's his his playing style and the way his body is built doesn't correlate. So I don't know what to do with that. Andrew Bortles just but neither does Vic. Like, neither does who? I don't think Vic correlates very well either. He's Vic. No, you're I right. Think Vic's better against the run than Ray is, from what I've seen anyway. Vic, Vic is weird too, because like, okay, so if you're a four-three team, are you gonna grade Vic Beasley as a defensive end? Because I'm almost like you have to play him at linebacker I mean, at the size he is, even if you're projecting that's a the ball. Construct. I, I, I play with Vic players now. Losing end. I'd, I'd, I'd change my scheme up for Vic, Vic Beasley. So, so would you play him wide? I mean, I guess that's what you'd have to do, right? You'd have to play Vic Beasley wide? Well, I, I would I play him strong. I'd either, I'd either play him strong side wide or I'd play him um, weak side defensive end or I'd play him inside in that uh, in that Daryl Washington heavy blitz roll. James okay. Collins. That makes sense. So I, I want to pick your guys' brain on another guy. Um that I'm not as high on nearly as anyone else. He has a, I believe he had a, the NFL Draft Scout just came out with their new update, right? Um, which is also CBS's sports uh, draft stuff. Um, and they have Nate Orchard ranked as a first slash second round pick. Um, that I don't see that at all with him. I mean, he's a guy who's had a bunch of production in college, um, 
but the way he is athletically, the way he's built, I mean, you almost see like a poor man's like Nick Perry, but even then Nick Perry had the bulk to him and he had the combine numbers to be like, oh, look, this guy has potential, you know, in the right scheme. Um, I probably have like a fifth round grade on Nate Orchard. I'm pretty sure like that's what I'm going to end up with him. Um, what do you guys think about him? I'm when honest. I watch Nate Orchard, Nate Orchard, you can go first. Talking about the guy from uh, Utah. Yes, sir. Yep. I, I like his bend off the edge. I like his ability to create sacks. But other than that, I'm not seeing a guy who's this monster pass rusher. Right. He, he don't get me wrong. He's a really good player. I just don't see this right. like monster pass rushing beast. Right. That that's where I am with him too. I mean, he's a guy who's going to give you decent reps off the bench, but you probably don't want him as a starter. I mean, those guys almost assuredly aren't those like starting type of guys. Um really the guy if we're talking about Utah, uh Star Little Lately's little brother whose name I'm spacing on right now. Um he's very very good. He's only a freshman and he's absolutely the guy to watch on Utah. See, I'm going to link it all the way back to former MWC team and talk about my favorite underclassman, not named Max Vallis. Um, but and he's not declaring. He's not declaring, no. and I'm very upset about that because he's my bae. But <laughs> the thing with Nate Orchard is that I don't think he's that much worse than, like, DeMarcus Lawrence was at Boise State. Because, I mean, the thing with DeMarcus Lawrence is that he also didn't have great bursts off the edge. He won with power, which made more sense because he was a bigger guy. And I think that Nate Orchard, he is good off the edge. I like it. I don't think he's very aware on the field. I don't think he's very smart. Um, from what I've seen, I probably have too, though. third. Like he, he's round, another one of those guys who kind of runs high cut. But the dude who I like, and he's not coming out this year, but I, he impressed me every time I watched. There's a guy on Boise State. His name is like yes. Kamalahi Correa. He yes. is freaking good. I like Correa, that guy. And then I the think that guy's going to be the first round when he comes out. Yeah, the corner at Boise and Correa, yeah. um, when I was watching the San Diego State game, those were the two guys that I was like, oh, okay, these are the guys I need to watch for, like, next year. The Correa guy is freaking good. Yeah, I, really I think good. Jinx I already really said, like, he's a first-round pick. Jinx is already, like, he's a first-round no, pick. No, I already so, took him. I already took him. <laughs> I covered the Yuhan game this year, September. He's mine. I told <laughs> so, Matt Harmon about him. He's mine. Fuck all right, that. so anyway. as far as, you know, we were talking about <laughs> DeMarcus Lawrence and stuff, right, and how Nate Orchard really isn't that different. Um, I'm kind of in the same boat with Holy Kikaha. So if you were forced to rank Kikaha, DeMarcus Lawrence, and Nate Orchard, how would you go? That's interesting because, I, you know what, Kikaha has been better this year for me than it was last year, um, mm. probably because he's been healthy. Like, he wasn't right. healthy last year. Right, and you worry about those issues. Again. Right. My issue is I still don't know how he wins in the NFL because he's small. Just tech. Now he yeah. says he's gained I mean, 10 pounds or he's going to gain 10 pounds. I don't know. I would yeah, probably yeah. say in order, I would I would probably do, I think with Kyle those his hands are awesome. He has great hand usage. He's awesome. Yeah, he's great So tech. I'm not super high in any of those three, but I would probably go, Kikaha, Orchard, Lawrence. Because I wasn't very high into Interesting. Lawrence. Interesting. See, I, I wasn't a big Lawrence guy either. I'm, I thought he was kind of like a second, third round type of guy. Um, but I take him a, a ahead of Orchard at this point. You're right. Um, I agree with you on the Kikaha yeah. thing. I mean, it's, it's going to be – I mean, already the medicals for Kikaha and Omagbeo de Gazoa are going to be huge. Like, that, that's really uh, I, like cool. I like I like Omagbeo de Gazoa. I like Diggy. Or we're calling him yeah. Diggy now. Diggy. Call him Diggy. Um, He's good. I mean, every time I watch him, he's good. I was watching a bunch of Ellis McCarthy, and he was the one who kept jumping off the tape. I will say, I think after watching all of you CLA, I think Hundley should have stayed because those rookie receivers are awesome. Duarte and Massington, freaking beasts. Should have stayed to play with them. Scott, you were going to say something about uh, Diggy? Yeah, I don't know how you keep saying Diggy, Diggy O's name so quickly. It's because Diggy I played against him in high school, man. Played against him. Yeah, I played him against. I, I played against him in high school. <laughs> I knew that actually. I think him, you told me that. Colt Ayerla, Who else did we play? We played a couple people. Yeah, they just trashed us. If you watch, I, I say this all the time. If you watch Colt Ayerla's like highlight tape from his senior year, it's all against Hood River Valley High School. Like it's just them, him just trashing these blue and gold helmets. 
Oh, I just want to watch Justice like try to pancake him and fall down on the ground. Man, uh, you need to find that. I was a, what? I was a, I was like a five eight, maybe two hundred pound center. I have an school. Oregon question though. So Eric right. Armstead. Yeah, he's I, gone. I like to force Buckner better. Okay. Um, I know that James Coburn has said he doesn't think that Eric Armstead is a starter for more than one year in the NFL. What do you think um, about Armstead? I think he's very strong, and I think that's how he wins. Um, at the next level, when everyone gets stronger, I think you worry about him. But he's got the frame where you could develop him still. I mean, remember this guy's a f- like this. This guy's kind of a freak athlete. Um, I I, I kind of want to see him outside of Oregon system because Oregon system doesn't really help him. I mean, really, what Oregon does is they just rush three like all game, all day, all game, and it's the most boring thing in the entire world. Like you, you like you like it's like watching people, Mike Nolan. Oh man, people are gonna try to watch Tony Washington and be like, he's an edge rusher. Why is he dropping back into coverage? Why is he covering in the slot the entire time? And it's just like this is what the outside linebackers in in uh, Oregon's three four do. Like they just like Oregon's Oregon's team is like we have basketball players playing on our defensive line. We're gonna rush three of them all game, and then we're gonna drop every single linebacker. Like that's just kind of what they do consistently. It's a very boring scheme, and I hate it. But that's just kind of what they are at this point. Interesting. So I had another question, but I don't remember it exactly. Actually, I do remember it. Oakman, Sean Oakman, Sean right. Oak Monster. However My you know him. So Goatman. <laughs> Scott does not like Sean Oakman. I know. I, I know. Scott thinks that Oakman is playing the wrong position and what he should play. My personal contention. My comparison for him is Jason Pierre-Paul. I think he should play off the edge. I think That's that he is an say. edge yeah. player. Should not play defensive tackle. Should not play 3-4 end. Should not play 5-tech. Should be an edge player. What do you think about Sean Oakman? Sean Oakman is Ron Burgundy. <laughs> what do I do with my hands? <laughs> you know, the one, the one thing that... Uh... <laughs> That's that Sean Oakman. I'm not saying he's... What Sean Oakman does with his hands is he pushes the guy in front of him back 10 yards into the quarterback. <laughs> and that's great if that's what a quarterback sack was. But that's not. He has no idea how to just go like this. Like the, Arm hey, over. Yep. Look, 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 look. Rip. Arm <laughs> over. That's it. That's all he has to learn. So he has to learn a rip. You bet he has to learn a swim. And they have to learn a spin after that because that's a perfect counter combination. Maybe even a cross chop. But he has to do something uh, instead of just bull, 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 bull. Oh, hey, there's the quarterback running by me. I'll put it this way. Bull, 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 bull. Oh, man. I just guy, if the worst oh. you can say about a guy is you have to teach him to swim off the edge, I will take him in the first round because he has every other skill he could possibly want in the first round pick. Yeah, but Do you I guys don't see worry him about... as a top ten pick. Is what I'm saying. I don't see him as oh, anything. Don't that, no. I don't. I don't see him as anything that needs to be standing up. I see him as a late first, early second round guy, who people are hyping up like a top five guy. Yeah, that's what I think about Gregory. The issue, is I, the issue I have is people are hyping him up to be way better than he is, and then when he goes in the late first, early second round. You'd be like, man, they got a huge deal. I hate yeah, to say that's one thing is, I, I know teams, like Rasheed Hageman last year. Yeah. Teams are teams don't like Oakman nearly as much as the media does at this point. Um, really? Yeah. They, they well, they think about him like Scott thought about him. Like you said, like a late first, early second round pick. Um, I think maybe that changes a little bit at the combine. Um, one thing that I've heard about Oakman that people are kind of worried about, like on the low, is uh, his thin hips. Like his hips aren't big. Um, so some, like, I, I talked to a dude and he was comparing him to, like, Vernon Golston, like a bigger version of Vernon Golston. I was like, oh, that's a interesting one. I was talking to an NFC South scout who was like, yeah, he's probably not going to be on our board based on our scheme. Yeah, um, he, I mean, if you're playing, if you're playing the three four, what are you gonna do? I don't think he he's too big, you know, he's too lengthy at this point to play as an outside linebacker. And unless you're gonna throw a bunch of weight on him, he's not gonna be a five tech. So it's really hard. My thought is that if you're whining about someone being too long to be an outside linebacker, you're not very imaginative, and you're using and, you're, and you shouldn't be a coach. Like, okay, fair enough. The guy has long arms. He's really quick off the edge. He has great power in his hands. Like, everyone said the same thing about Jason Pierre-Paul three years ago, that he was too long to be a stand-up defensive man, that he was lazy, that he didn't know how to play the game. Well, to be fair, he didn't play stand-up. 
He all played with his hand in the dirt. Center. Yeah, but here's the thing. I'll put this way. When I said Jason Pierre Paul, I saw an elephant. That's special. He shows the skills to be the same player that Pierre Paul was to me. Pierre Paul plays two techniques, has two pass rush moves, and is great against the run. That's all Pierre Paul does. Don't get me wrong. He's amazing. I want him in Atlanta next year if they move to a 4 3. That being said. So if you were to redraft him, where would you take him? Pierre Paul? Yeah. I think he went in the perfect spot. He went That's where I would same. take Oakman. I would take Oakman in the exact same spot. But I don't see Pierre Paul and Oakman. I, I see Oakman and Oakman. I see Jamal Anderson and Oakman, who Jamal Anderson should have gone in the late first, early second round, as opposed to number eight overall. When Atlanta took o- took Anderson number eight overall, I said, man, they should have taken Patrick Willis. Well, the thing with Jamal Anderson, he didn't even do anything in college. He was just a combine riser. He didn't do anything. What's Oakman doing in college? He did he more than Oakman did. He did more than Oakman did. But he only played the defense tackle for one year, right? He had sort of switched from tight end. Yeah, he only played end for a year, but still, he, he had, you know, 15, 16 sacks in the season from what I remember. Maybe I'm wrong, but I don't remember I that at all. But I'm so so I'm, I'm going to throw out two more names. I'm going to throw out two more names as guys as potential edge rushers. Um, one of them might not be an edge rusher for y'all at all. Um, uh, Shalik Calhoun and Zach Hodges. All right, so Zach Hodges, I actually watched him against Brown. Okay. Um, so I actually have Zach Hodges' experience. I don't think he's that good. I think a lot of people seem to like like him and they give him like a plus one because he went to an Ivy school and he's not out of the Ivy school. I wouldn't take him before round four. My issue with Shalik Calhoun is I think he's like an ordinary player. I just don't see bursts. I don't see anything special. I think he might be a 4-3 left end, yeah. but otherwise I'm not sure what he does. And I think they're better. For, I think that Ziggy do like Zig Ziggy Zua is a better 4-3 left end than uh, Shalik Calhoun. Yeah, and I, um, Diggy, Diggy can play across the board. That's one thing that I really like about uh, – that's one thing I like about Oa is that, like, really, I mean, like, he can play, in my opinion at least, he can play, like, three through seven. Like, he's going to be a very versatile player. I think that they're going to be, like – I think the Patriots will like him. Um, but moving on from – I think at some point we'll talk about, like, sort of, like, scouting insights, but, like, I think that there are some teams that are going to love him. I think he can go around one if he tests well. I, I have a one on him. Um, the thing, like, like I said, I, I mean, it's, everything is going to be that medical. Everything is going to be that medical. Now, what do you think about the – I don't know if you've watched any offensive tackles yet. You yeah, I've, did, I've watched right? a bunch of them. What do you think of Clemming from Pitt? Because I literally so I was gonna I was about to write on uh, Clemmings today, but then I got caught up in some other stuff, so I'm hoping I can do it tomorrow. Um, he's very raw, but he's very good. I mean, when he demolishes guys, he'll just he just runs train on runs runs trains on dudes. So do you think he's like? Because I watched him, I wasn't that impressed. I have to rewatch him because everyone seems to be very impressed with him. Do you think he's like Baby Greg Robinson? Yeah, kind of. Um, like he's definitely like a freak athlete. Um, he has a really good punch. He he doesn't keep balance at all. Like there, there's one play against yeah. I believe Duke where he just gets all tied up. Like his feet cross and everything when he's trying to like uh, ride this dude out on the edge. Like you could you you tell why he's a right tackle and not a left tackle, even at Pittsburgh. Um, but I mean we've seen guys like J.R. Sweezy right who've come into the league as a defensive tackle, convert to offensive line, and just demolish things once they figure out their technique. Um, he, he's going to be a, one of those type of guys who are like a freak athlete. It wouldn't surprise me if he, like, if at the Senior Bowl, he just rose up incredibly. Like, he's one of those guys who I could see the potential of rising all the way up. But where would you draft him right now? Where right now? I think I'd, take, I, I'd spend a late first on him. I don't I think I'd go not. higher than that. Oh. Huh? Would you spend a late first on J.R. Sweezy? But J.R. Sweezy's playing guard. I, Clemmings yeah, can play a tackle. The issue with Clemmings is that he's just so raw. Yeah, like, he's very raw. I, I need a little bit more out of a first-round pick. It might just be me. I mean, I, I'm also kind of moving to our team. Let's not take any offensive tackles in the first round because you can just get better value later in the draft on them. Well, that's what Especially Green Bay does now, right? Green Bay's about to get – Green Bay's about to position. You can say that about any position. You can say, hey, you can take an offensive tackle later in the draft. You can take a guard. You can take a center. You can take a quarterback. You can take a fullback. You can take a running you can back. Take a quarterback. There are no good quarterbacks. They're drafted. Yeah, my 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 
for any position, though, outside right. of cornerback. If you go See, my, 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 my counterpoint would be that round, you have to, like, you got two positions that really make sense, pure first round, and it's quarterback and cornerback. I would say edge player, too. Yep. I've ran the regressions on edge players and defensive linemen, and it's incredible how good the NFL is at being able to hit them. Like, linebackers, linebackers generally, you could just find dudes. Like, there's just bodies. Um, but as far as, like, edge rushers, defensive linemen are, it very rarely are these guys not first-round picks that end up being, like, these all-pro and Pro Bowl types. Yeah. I think that's fair. I think with the, with the three-cone drill as well, like, it sort of, like, it separates men from the boys. You know, the Patriots use that almost exclusively. I will say this about J.R. Sweezy now that you mention it. I just looked on my uh, my archive of 2009 to 2013 NFL drafts. Okay. Sorry, 2009-2014 NFL draft players. He ranked 89th out of all six drafts in terms of raw athleticism based on his combine numbers. Yeah, he's a freak. Um, he's, he, yeah, definitely, he's like, I, I've talked to Ted Sunquist about this before, and he's like, if I went back into the league... I'm not totally sure I wouldn't just have, like, defensive linemen converting to offensive line on the practice squad just, like, consistently. I agree. I mean, I think Clemmings right now, for me, the earliest I would think about taking him is third round. See, I I don't know. See, I'm, I'm See, just trying to think, though, right? About the thing. But I think in general, <laughs> like, I'm just... I need to rewatch all the offensive tackles. Maybe that'll be our position for next week, but I just... I don't think I value a position that highly anymore because I see guys like Solder in New England and Vollmer as well, and Vollmer is so much better. And Solder is, like, okay, but Vollmer is just a lot better. And I just see all these other off tackles. They all seem to be late-round picks. Like, look at all the first-round picks in the past few years. They haven't been very good. Granted, Jake Matthews has been getting better, but would I have picked him number six overall? Probably not. I would have. Just the way that he's playing right now, if he can continue it next year, people are going to go and just continue improving too. People are going to go, man, what a great pick that was. Maybe we should take top ten offensive tackles. Like, there's two offensive tackles I think are going to have people say that. Actually, when you look at it, I think there's three. Because Tyron Smith was a top, what, 11, 12 pick? Yep. And he's a yeah. monster. And Yo, people, got, people don't remember this. Like, like when, Sean, when Chantrell Henderson was playing at USC – they were going to move Matt Khalil to right tackle, and Tyrone Smith was just going to ride the bench. Like, that seems, like, insane. Matt Khalil. Well, here's the thing. He Matt bus. Khalil couldn't play right tackle because he didn't have he's, – he's so clunky moving to his right that they had to keep him at left. He's a left tackle only. Mm-hmm. Like, I've made that designation with three players. Well, Fisher was like that too, Ever. in my opinion. Fisher is bad too, though. Eric Fisher, I agree. Tackle. So yeah. was Lynn Johnson, kind of. Yeah, when they were like, "Yo, we're playing Fisher at right tackle to start his rookie but year." But I think like, that oh, this is not good. Draft class, and they just sucked. That might have just been an awful draft class in retrospect. People should have taken Ansa. People should have taken the math r- the math it's rusher. Terrible. People should have taken Sheldon Richardson, the math rusher. People people should have taken. Ansa, I think you know, Ansa. Desmond Trufant, who has proven to be way better than a guy who yeah. never moved. Like, oh, who never really had to flip his hips due to the scheme. Oh, we're talking about Dean Milliner? We're talking about the bus. Yeah, friggin' Milliner's garbage. Well, yeah. the god Xavier Rhodes is getting better. Xavier Rising. Well, h- how much is that to Zimmer, right? Like, I-, I feel like you could just put no. any cornerbacks with Zimmer, and Zimmer will just make them amazing. Well, but here's the thing. Rhodes was awful the first few weeks of the season. He was not very good. He was learned like- how to play by the referee's rules because now his contact's gotten a lot better and he shut down Julio. He was killer on Calvin. He killer. He's been awesome. He didn't shut down Julio. Let's not get crazy. He did crazy. a good job against Julio. He did you know who really shut down job. Julio? Uh, Sam Shields. Sam Shields shut down Julio. <laughs> yeah. Oh, wait. That's not what shut down means. <laughs> yeah, he got he, trash, man. He, he was well, terrible that entire game. And then Sam the broke up two passes and just beat him at the catch point twice. I was like, oh, no. We need Devon House back next season. Please Julio don't talk about him. He didn't have a call Ryan in that game. And he still had, what, six catches for 82 yards in a bad game? Was it, all I know is Xavier Rhodes is pretty good. I think he's very good. 
But anyway, so you guys are both kind of insiders. Know that uh, that just has inside scoop and a lot of things. So what's some insider information that you're hearing about? Nothing. Oh, no, no, nothing. No, I was just giving you the okay, the okay on naming me an insider now. Oh, okay. Good to know. <laughs> Um, so as far as in, inside scoop, I mean, outside of dudes declaring, like, uh, what's his name? Duke Williams out of uh, Auburn's going to end up declaring. I don't think that's out yet. Um, I, I, man, I'm going to butcher his name. But Patowski, who's like the left tackle at uh, Utah, he's going to end up declaring. Devontae Booker, who is a one-year guy Devontae coming out of junior Booker. college, he's going to end he's up declaring. Really good. Yeah. Um, pe- people really don't know about Buckner or not. Like, Buckner seems to be the one on the fence. Arik Armstead is done. He's, he's, he's out at Oregon. Didn't uh, Rand Gettlin say that Beckner was going to come back? He he said that he was, like, conflicted or something, which is pretty much what I've heard. Like, pe- people, what, what, what I've heard at this point is that, like, he doesn't really know where he's going to go, but once he knows, he's probably going to end up declaring. But at this point, he's kind of conflicted. So yeah, the extent of my insight is that the Patriots like Todd Gurley last year. Todd Gurley's going to slip to 32. They're going to take him. If they're at 32. He won't last that long. I've heard. I don't think he'll last that long. Why? So Belichick and bench him after a single really fumble? Like him. No, Gurley, Gurley's not going to last past the middle of the first round. From everything I'll put I've it heard. this way. I heard a couple of years ago when the Patriots took Dante Hightower that there are teams that were really mad that the Steelers let the Patriots get Dante Hightower. So there's going to be an effort to keep the Patriots from getting Todd Gurley, and I'm totally fine with that. Well, that's almost like the Dominic Easley thing with Seattle, right? Like that thing was whole. Yeah. That thing was all telegraphed. It was like, we just need someone to draft Dominic Easley before Seattle gets to him. Pretty much. Yeah. Now he's out for the season, which kind of said. Yeah, that's a bummer. Yeah. I mean, how how much is that? How much is that he's hurt again, and how much is that is like we might as well just let him heal. I mean, I think it's a little bit of both. He did look a lot better as the year went on. Mm-hmm. Um, he looked really good the last four weeks. He looked, his game against the Colts probably the best game of the season. But See, I was trying to win. He killed against, against, against the Broncos. He was great against the Broncos. But I think that the Patriots are they're so deep on defense right now. I don't think they really need him. I think people sort of underrated how good a defense that is. Well, like, like Dominic Easley was like a freak, That's though. That's a good defense. Like, Dom- Dominic Easley is, like, insane. Easley hasn't looked as explosive this year, but he's gotten a lot better in terms That's of technique. That's a bummer. Like, he's gotten so much better in terms of thinking. He's so good against the run now. He was beastly against the run. And the Patriots actually had him standing up at times this year, and they brought him as an elephant. Interesting. It was so, a and big elephant, not going to lie. Yeah. It was when Chandler was out, though. So I'm trying to think of guys who have gone in the first round who have been injured on the defensive line. Um, I'm thinking over the past decade, I mean, is it – is it Star, even though that wasn't really an injury, that was more of a heart concern? So it's probably Star, Justin Harrell, and Dominic Easley. I mean, it's guys that were just There's absolute more. freaks. You think? I mean, there's not that many first-round picks. Um, and who else was hurt? Who was hurt, hurt in college? Hurt in college, right? Yeah. Who was like hurt? Hurt through the draft process, I guess I should say. Something showed up to do that draft process. Was Cameron Hayward hurt? Yeah. Might okay. have been, yeah. So that's another one. So we have four. We have four in the past decade. I'm sure there are more. I just can't think of them right now. Yeah, it's hard to do off the top. Was this Copel's hurt? Yeah. Is Copel's a defensive tackle? I mean, would you count him? He played him? defensive tackle at UNC and they moved yeah. him. Fair enough. But yeah, that's an interesting one. Um, Maybe... This is this is ter- this is terrible hangout sound. It's just me going through a chart. Yeah. Who, who was and oh, wasn't hurt? Parsons um, would be killing you right now if he wasn't murdering me. He's not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I can't think of another guy who is injured throughout the draft process that was still drafted in the first round, other than those four. Um, and I mean those four are like pretty sizable names. I mean, people still talk about Justin Harrell in the scouting circles, like he was gonna be like Indomik and Sue if he hit, which okay. I find like crazy. Okay. Okay. They, they love they love Harold, man. I don't know why either. Okay. Yeah, him. I don't. I don't know. That's just because what people they, are saying. They clearly just don't value production whatsoever, or or ability, <laughs> or also that might have been the worst draft since 
last year's draft. After the first round. The 07 draft? The 07 draft? That was yeah. an awful draft. That was oh, right. when the Patriots yeah. picked six UDFAs who did not make the team. Only one player on that team actually made the Patriots, and that was Merriweather. No other Patriot pick made it. Oh, man. Yeah, it's like Calvin Johnson, Joe Thomas, Adrian Peterson, and then, like, yo. So it was Lowell's Pat, top. Pat, yeah, yeah, I guess Pat, Patrick Wills, Marshawn Lynch, Daryl Rivas. So there's, like, the, the, very, like, the biggest names in the game, <laughs> and then, like, no one. Yeah, hey, it was the most top-heavy draft ever. I think Atlanta, that's the draft where there was, like, two offensive guard day players who made the Pro Bowl. I have to look it up, actually. But what were you saying, Scott? We're talking about 2007, right? Yeah. Atlanta had a second-round pick from 2007 give them at least eight good years already in Justin Blaylock, and Steven Nicholas wasn't a bad pick in the fourth. But after that, I'll agree. Yeah, they, there's not there's not a lot going on in this draft. Chris Houston wasn't a horrible. All right, I just want to read the after the second round. So the second round had I believe two Pro Bowlers. Let me check. I'm just looking on Wikipedia right now. In the second round had more than that. So the second round had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven Pro Bowlers in it, which is pretty good. Once we get past the second round of this draft, so after Ryan Khalil at pick 59, here are the Pro Bowlers from this draft: Jacoby Jones. Marshall James, okay. Paul Soliai, Zach Diossi, Jermon Bushrod, Deshaun Goldson, Laron McLean, Corey Graham, and Nick Folk, and Brandon Fields. And you really consider a kicker a That's pro That's really bowler. bad. Well, he just counted two special teamers as pro bowlers, like two dudes Three. who were like, playing on special Diossi teams. Diossi, too. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Y'all, you, you were counting, like, gunners. Like, we count gunners out here? <laughs> yeah, that's Corey true. Graham. Why did Corey Graham make the Pro Bowl? Was he a special teamer? Yeah, all right, we do count kickers. Never mind. Let's be fair. We'll count. If we're going to count gunner, gunners, we'll count kickers. How did Ron McClain even make the Pro Bowl? Was he, he was good one year, right? He had, like, one really good year. Ron McClain, the fullback? Yeah. Because he's a fullback. And because they... One- but didn't he make it as a running back one year? Maybe was... Oh, man. Dwayne Jarrett was picked 45th overall. Yeah. I forgot about his existence. Yeah. Yeah, that happened. Who oh, was? Oh, my God. He was picked between – it was Sidney Rice, Dwayne Jarrett, Lamar Woodley, David Harris. Yeah. Whew. You look – you did not – That was also yeah. the – I think that was the draft where the Lions totally bottomed out. Is I remember they picked Drew Stanton in the second round of that draft, and they all, was that the round where they picked Jordan Dyson? Yeah. Oh my God, I think that was. No, I don't think it was. It was the draft where they picked Ikaika Alama Francis from Hawaii. From Hawaii, yep. Non math rusher. Shouts to non math rushers. A non math rusher was Shelton Victor Abiyamiri a math rusher. Is who? Victor Abiyamiri. Uh, I could check. I can actually check. What round was he drafted in? Second, Second round, Philadelphia. <laughs> that was the draft. Wait, how was Brendan and me being never That was the John Beck draft, where Atlanta got two solid contributors sandwiching John Beck. How has Brendan and me being not made a Pro Bowl? He hasn't made a Pro Bowl? Uh-uh. Yeah. Oh, no, Vic, Vic, so Victor never ran at the combine. Victor was hurt. <laughs> he, Jermaine, Mark, Jermaine Cunningham, and Tank Carradine are the th- the guys in the past decade who haven't ran at the combine who were drafted in the second round as far as head rushers. Jermaine is. Cunningham also killed his pro day, from what I remember. Killed. See, it. I don't have enough data on it then. So it must have been yeah, it must have been not all reported and stuff like that. Man, I thought Probably Brandon Jackson. How has Charles Johnson not made it to the Pro Bowl? Because he is a damn good football player. Yeah, some of them are weird. Some of them are different. AJ Hawk made a Pro Bowl. Like I don't know what to tell you. AJ Hawk's like about to Mark make another Pro Bowl. Like, State for I a while. AJ Hawk made a Pro Bowl. It makes me think Paul Warlow is going to make a Pro Bowl. And I don't get me wrong, I like Paul Warlow, but he's not a Pro Bowl caliber linebacker right now. No, he just gets, picks up those stats. He gets a ton of tackles, but he ain't a pro bowler. Right. So, okay. So, let's move a little bit. Um, so, this draft, we both said, I think that Justin and I agree, Mark Mario is number one pick. We call him so, Mark now? I think he's number one. I don't think that 
Scott you agrees, though. Scott, who would you number one, number one pick? Do you guys really need me to confirm that Marcus Mariota should go number one? So I we're mean, all agreeing that Mariota is your number one. I've that for months now. And my is Mariota going to be this year's Teddy? Dude, people yeah. are going to clown him so hard for his personality. He's going to be wild. No, but he's going to go number one. So because, be no, I don't think he's going to drop, but people are still going to hit him with that st- same stuff. They're going to hit him with that stuff, and then people are going to go, no, man, he's like Aaron Rodgers. See, what would your comparison for Marcus Mariota be right now? So what I've been going on is, like, if Russell Wilson and Ryan Tannehill, like, somehow merged and made one dude, like, the whatever's in between them is probably Marcus Mariota. See, and I see more of a – how do I explain it? You're saying, like, a gumbied Russell yeah. Wilson? Yeah. Yeah, with, like, a little bit less arm. Like, a little bit less. Gumby Russell Wilson, kind of like how uh, – Mike Glennon is Gumby Matt Ryan with the Scarecrow brain. Um, no, nah, I don't know. He sees the field so much better than people give him credit for. It, a guy doesn't just go out there and hit the wide open guy every single play because, oh, it's the easy pick. Scott, but, but they, just feed, they just feed him with the signs. He doesn't yeah. even have to read anything. They just hold up the sign, and he's just like an idiot out there, and he just scores a bunch of touchdowns, and anyone can do it at Oregon, right? Everyone. Yeah, and if ev- anybody could do it at Oregon as well as him, uh, no. They're, they're, <laughs> you don't understand. This is the fight that I've been fighting for three years. Three no, years of this. That's the thing that I hate about people who try and evaluate quarterbacks but don't understand the game of football and what it takes to be a quarterback. Well, you watch that Michigan State game, right? Like, you watch that Michigan State game, and you see him, like, Michigan State just firing off pressure in his face. And he needs to instantly know, all right, this is, like, this is my hot, and I need to get it there in, like, this exact small, very small window. And that's the only way I can do it. And then he puts it perfectly on his dude, and his dude takes it, like, 60 yards. Plus, and you, you got to consider, like, part, like, me at a sushi bar. Like, <laughs> like, 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 that's, like, it's amazing. He's just ridiculous. He's very good. No, um, I just my comparison for it is it's gonna sound maybe a little bit heretical, but it's something I think it might be a little bit overrated by some, but I think it works really well for Mariota. He reminds me a little bit of Troy Aikman when he was on the Cowboys, because I I kind of well, if you, well, I, I'm just saying because I think Aikman's a little bit. I think Aikman's good, but he's a little bit overrated. But the thing that reminds me of him is his ability in the pocket. I think that Mariota has really good pocket presence. There was one play in that Michigan State game. I know Justice knows exactly the play I'm talking about, where I think that he was, like, being attacked by rushers on all sides. He almost stumbled to the ground, like, picked himself up, but he always kept his eyes down the field. He never shifted off of his reads and was, like, going through progressions while balancing himself and looking down the field. And that's sort of like what I want in a quarterback, to be honest. I mean, I really like his overall body of work, and I was not a big fan of his last year. I had a second-round grade on him last year. I had the same grade and him that I had in Bortles. But he's gotten better this year to me. I think that this year he's proven that he's a first-round pick. Well, you got to remember what offensive line he's playing for too, right? Like at one point, Oregon, they have two guards – who I believe are uh, their their new starters, right? Last season they had they had the ta- they had a tandem of guards that were under six foot, which made them the smallest guards in all of college football. Now they put two new guards out there who are not NFL prospects. Aronis Grosfu, their center, who is a you know all American type center, um, ended up getting hurt. Uh, Tyler Johnstone, who is their left tackle starting in the year, blew up his ACL in the bowl game, then blew up his ACL in the, uh, like in the summer too. So they had to move Jake Fisher from right go- or right tackle to left tackle, where he had never played before. Then Jake Fisher got hurt, and also uh, Andre Uretrega. I'm going to butcher oh, that, that name. Guy. Yeah, he was hurt too. So yeah. at one point. Green Bay basically, or Green Bay, Oregon basically had you know a you know a replacement center, two like just dumpsters at at guard, and then they had a true uh, you know a true freshman left tackle who was playing and a walk on playing right tackle, and that's when you saw the stretch of you know the first Arizona game, the Washington State game, where it was literally it was Mariota against the world, like it was just like against the Washington State yeah. State game specifically, like Xavier Cooper just hung out in the backfield that entire Washington State game. Like, people Xavier are going to watch that game for him and freak out. Yeah. Right, let's see, let's, let's, be, let's be fair to the rest of Oregon. It wasn't Mariota versus the world. 
It was Marietta and all of his skill weapons. Well, what skill weapons weapons does he have? Because as as far as draftable players go at wide receiver, wide receiver, I mean, the only wide receivers that he's going to have that are going to get drafted from his career are Josh Huff, who ended up going, I believe, what was it, the third or fourth round, and then Braylon Addison. Yeah, and then Braylon Addison, who's been hurt this entire season. Outside of that, I mean, maybe Devon Allen when he progresses. Um, but he's a true freshman this year. I mean, when you really talk about what skill guys he's been surrounded with, outside of running backs, I mean, there's really not that much. I mean, I, as far as guys like talking about the future, I mean, Royce Freeman is going to be a beast. Oh, yeah. And I think also, to be fair to Washington State, Xavier Cooper is really good. <laughs> Every time I watch him, I'm very impressed. Yeah. But he's definitely the best guy on that roster. I will say, though, Brett Humley has the same exact arguments in his favor because his offensive line has been awful all year as well. Oh, Hundley got Logan. Um, I, I was saying this like I said this Logan. last year. He's getting Logan, man. Like y'all don't really realize like what kind of stuff he's doing in this offense and like what he's surrounded by. Um, when you watch that Virginia game, Mazone isn't letting him like. Call, like make any sort of adjustments at the line of scrimmage. Like he motioned out a running back, and the linebacker stayed there, and they still ran a draw. Like that's insane. Like when like if, if he stays there, you just you pull that and you just pop it to a running back. And it's not. I guess it's not. I mean, I've talked to guys who like like James Light and guys on Twitter and stuff like that. Where I'm like, yo, what exactly happened here? Is Hundley really this bad at making reads? And they're just like, no, he's not that bad at making reads. Just Mazone, like r- he is the quarterback of that team. Like, he's not going to let you option out of anything. So I think almost like Hundley might be a better pro than he was a college player just because he's able to actually do stuff at the line of scrimmage and actually be able to make reads before plays. That's my thing with Hundley. I think that he's Mm -hmm. he impresses me a lot physically. He has cam physicality to me, although maybe a little bit smaller. Definitely Um, a little bit smaller. Definitely a little bit smaller. (laughs) I mean, my my thing with Hundley is that I've heard that he has an attitude that some other guys didn't have. Well, um, was it you was telling sure. me that you were like, he, he's more of a politician than a leader? Yeah, I, I've heard I, that, that his locker room doesn't like him. Um, and I think Which part is of odd because, be because the, the union like the... thing, I've heard the union thing is yeah. something that a lot of pro people don't like. I don't know how true that is. I've just heard it from a couple of people. Um, but... Right, I'm, I'm in the same boat as you. Like, I've heard these things rallying around, around, but like, people said the same thing about Derek Carr, right? Like, let's not forget someone, uh, a, a sure. team... A team red flagged Derek Carr for spending time with his child who almost died like two weeks before the season. We know which team that was. Instead of being the first one in, in into the room and last one out. We know which team that is, by the way. I would love I to. I do not. I wish I knew. Yeah, no, I, I I don't know. I was just I was just told about that where they were just like, I man, teams are getting what like when you hear character red, like there's levels to character red. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Hunley, in my opinion, yeah, I would are. probably give him. I think he's better than Connor Cook, who's going back to school anyway. Right. I would probably put a second. I would put around the same grid as Carr. I right. I believe. Him. I mean, I, I I think it's pretty evident at this point that Hundley's the third best quarterback in this class. After Jameis and. After Jameis and um, Marcus. I mean, the thing with Jameis is I think that Jameis and Hundley are a little bit closer together than people might think. Well, Jameis is just terrible at Jameis. reading underneath coverage, right? Like, my issue with Jameis, Jameis is kind of telegraph he... stuff, and then dudes will just jump on him. And that's why he well, gets all those Jameis is a better prospect than Johnny was last year? No. Yeah, but I wasn't a huge Johnny guy. Yeah, I don't think he's better than Johnny. I think that Johnny's arm is better, to be honest. Really? Yeah. Johnny, I mean, if you're watching these Cleveland games, I mean, Johnny's arm right now is not it's looking very game. good at all. But Johnny also might have needed a little bit more time, and I think also you part think of you 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 think Johnny work. football needed more time than like three fourths of the season? Yeah, you think he needed something to adjust to? Like, oh, okay, I'm not throwing to Mike Evans every single play and having two first round left tackles surrounding me at all times. You think just a little bit? <laughs> I don't think Bortles should be playing right away either. He has Joe well, Bortles Tom. isn't good. Bortles isn't good right away either. I like his tackles. Bortles is bad. Bortles. <laughs> I, I think I, I I looked at the numbers and it was something like for every, every quarterback who's thrown at least 50 passes and has a touchdown interception ratio which leans towards interceptions over touchdowns has been benched this season except for Blake Bortles. So yeah, he has he has that going for him. But also, I mean, like you you look at like what Cecil Shorts is doing to him right now and he's just absolutely killing Bortles. Like Cecil Shorts just doesn't drop like doesn't catch anything anymore. I don't know what happened. Yeah. To him. And Jack Schroeder loved him so much. I remember Jack Schroeder said he was a top 15 receiver in football. 
Well, people were saying he was like Greg Jennings, right? They're like, he's Greg Jennings in his prime already. No. <laughs> no. All right, I'm going to have to bounce real fast, all right? All right, see ya. It was nice sitting with y'all. See ya. Bye. It was fun. All right, there goes Justice. That was fun. So, what are we talking about now? You just sort of ran away. I mean, at this point, we've got like 15, 20 minutes left at the I mean, other than we're going to decide what we're going to talk about next week. I feel like that's where we can go, and then we can uh, tease it for next week. I feel like since we did defense this week, we should go offense primarily next week. I'm fine with that. I would say trenches. I would say offensive tackle. I feel like if we just did defensive tackle, though, we need to go with something a little bit more... What's the word? Explosive. You thinking I'm, running back? I'm thinking receiver. All right. I can dig that. I like the I'm receiver thinking, class. So I have opinions already on this class. I've already watched them. So I'll get to rewatch. I, I'm, I'm going to have to rewatch a good bit of it, but I, I'm a big fan of these receivers. And I think after that, we should go to, uh, to edge players. I'm cool with that order. For sure. So, we're going to hit up the edge players next week. Right, edge players. We're going to receivers. Receivers next week. After that, we're going to have edge players. Get those taken care of. Um, yeah. I'm Scott. Then I guess offensive tackle? Yeah, we can do offensive tackle after that, because then it makes sense, because you see edge players and offensive tackles back-to-back. You're probably watching the same group of film back-to-back weeks. So we're talking about receivers. I'm guessing probably we'll find a nice guest for next week. Um, this is in a lot of people like receivers here. Maybe we're going to justice back in two weeks, talk more about edge players, more about what he's heard. Um, it'll be fun. And hopefully Ben can join us next week. Hopefully Ben can join us. Ben, we miss you. Or Zach, somebody. <laughs> yeah, I think Zach will be mourning his team not making the playoffs next week. Because there's no way they shouldn't have made the playoffs this year. Who, the, uh, the Dolphins? The Dolphins. They, they're they frustrating to watch. I'll put it that way. I, I have I, no idea how they didn't make the playoffs this year, but I will say the Patriots destroyed them last week a lot. Are they, out of, are they like mathematically out? I don't think they're mathematically out, but they need a lot to happen. Oh yeah. Because the issue is that both all the, the issue is that your division sucks so much that all of the AFC North teams are ahead of them, except for the Browns. I mean, what do you want out of the NFC South when they've got to go? I, I mean, you know what I want out of the NFC South for you to be above five hundred. Well, guess what? They get the AFC South next year, <laughs> and they get the NFC East next year. So they get the Giants and Washington and themselves and Jacksonville and Tennessee. So there's going to be pretty simple games, in my opinion, for a lot of teams. I'm going to end on this thought. I just thought of this. If I'm the Giants, I try to trade Eli Manning this offseason. I try to trade him to the Bucks. The Bucks say like yes. The Bears should try and trade Cutler, and and the Eagles should try and trade Foles, and uh, well, trading a quarterback. The is Bucks not. say yes if they try to trade Eli to them for like a lot of picks. I feel like Lovey would. Is he's Lovey? I wouldn't give like a fifth round pick for Eli, let alone a, a first round pick. I agree. I'm talking about low Let me take a declining quarterback in a bad scheme. I, I wouldn't touch Eli at this point. Not for a fifth-round pick. I think Lovey would trade us first. If he did <sighs> that, I would laugh, but I think he would. There's some nightmare fuel for all you Bucks fans out there. Ugh. Anyway, that's Ethan Hammerman. I'm Scott Kurasik. We will. Bye. Uh...
We'll be back next week. Same Kvetch time, same Kvetch place. Happy Hanukkah. Oh, yes, and happy Hanukkah.